was 69 alternate realities. I actually counted. So why did I choose this as one of my first deep dives? Well, it's because I love getting sucked into a bagel. And this whole movie is symbolically and structurally a bagel. But how dense is the bagel? Is there anything at the center of that bagel? I'm Eric Voss, and this is New Rockstar's The Deep Dive. And let us dive deep into everything everywhere all at once. The award-winning film written and directed by the Daniels, starring Michelle Yeoh as a woman who gets sucked into a multiversal crisis in the shape of a bagel. In 2022, the big multiverse event was supposed to be Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, a movie that I liked, but looking back, I think most would agree Everything Everywhere All at Once is truly the movie that doesn't pull its punches when it comes to multiverse delights. It gives its multiverse a pulse. And the crazy thing is, the directors have said they just wanted to make a kung fu love letter to the Matrix, and they teamed up with the directors of Avengers Endgame to do it. So is this bagel a mere Marvel audition piece with nothing new to say about nihilism? Or is there something deeper here? A deeply personal story about regret, told with the Daniels turned down for what? Flair, resulting in the only movie to date to give the multiverse a beating heart. Answering that question will be my mission as I dive deep into this film, shot by shot, analyzing the visual details no one else is really talking about to reveal how these filmmakers stitch together such a multiversal gut punch. Since Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheiner, the Daniels, are such pros at practical workarounds, this seemingly complex film is actually structured in a self-contained bagel with just six parts, really. Six tier settings. The Wong family home, wrapped around that, the family business at the laundromat, strangling that, the IRS office building, orbiting all of that, the alternate life paths of the multiverse, absorbing all of that, Jobu Tupaki's everything bagel, and then finally at the center of that bagel, the mysterious void at the core of it. We're gonna figure out what's really in the middle of that. Is it just an empty hug that fails to actually cure nihilism? Or is there something else in there that you can see if you look hard enough at this movie? We open on the Wong family, Evelyn, Waymond, and Joy singing karaoke framed in this circular mirror. We actually see the karaoke machine glowing on the left, and then on the right, a raccoon figure foreshadowing our dear Rakakuni. But this mirror is an Alice in Wonderland style looking glass. Our first example of recurring circles in this movie, all leading to the ultimate bagel, but here depicting a fantasy that this movie never ever once gives us. These three characters all truly happy together. Even Evelyn can't believe it, notice she wipes away a tear. Also notice she covers Joy's mouth, because according to the directors, the song they're singing is Aqua's Barbie Girl, and Evelyn didn't want her daughter singing, you can brush my hair, undress me everywhere. But while we're talking about the music here, the band Sun Lux's piano music evokes a section of Harold Arlen's Somewhere Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz. Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up till the clouds are far behind me. Like Dorothy dreaming of Oz, Evelyn is dreaming of an alternate life path that may or may not be real by the end of the movie. We glide through this looking glass into reality, or a reality, the innermost bagel tier, the apartment. The mirror reflection smoothly transitioning into a reality we now inhabit. It's actually a nod to Robert Zemeckis' impossible mirror shot from Contact, one of my favorite shots ever. But notice here in the room, wait Evan's face is now shown in the circular mirror behind Evelyn. Actually, behind Evelyn, there's a pair of googly eyes on that purple laundry bag. Wayman leaves these around to Evelyn's chagrin, but this pair is on bag 042, the one Evelyn will later be looking for. Sorry, it was too crowded here, so I moved some upstairs. I think the clones are happier there. See? They're happier here. Number 42 is missing in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Number 42 is the answer to the meaning of life, everything. And so for Evelyn, the meaning is missing. Wayman specifically leaves googly eyes on places he knows Evelyn Evelyn will look, the laundry bags he know will get picked up that day, the out of order sign, the baseball bat Evelyn always uses to tap the vent to get Wayman's attention. He does this all to try to cheer her up. Because notice in this opening scene, she refuses to really look at her husband. He has to physically turn her in her chair away from her receipts. And he says, this is what the googly eyes are all about. The only eyes that matter are our own. And the camera cuts back to show more of the apartment, including a photo of baby Evelyn with her father. And despite being out of focus, you can see Evelyn feel a bit more relaxed and a bit proud of this life that she's built. But then, I love this detail, Michelle Yeoh bobs her head down and returns to her anxiety. At this point in the movie, it hasn't been established what the head shaking has been about. But this is a gesture characters do when their minds burst jump. So what we just saw was Evelyn's mind 
drifting to a happier place. Now, co-director Daniel Kwan told the Script Notes podcast that this movie is an intersection between the multiverse and the immigrant experience. A lot of the multiverse and the immigrant stories is a questioning of like life paths and decisions and, and asking yourself, what if? You know, that's mm -hmm. so much of, when I talk to my mother about her past, a lot of it is like, what if this happened? What if that happens? The whole immigrant experience is about the, this br like ever branching uh, list of possible uh, life paths that you could have taken. And so I believe that is the root myth of this movie. An immigrant mother tries to find her way home. And you stay up at night wondering to yourself, how can we get back? Even the simple notion of home is a way more complicated thing for families like this. Because in order to survive, they must merge their homes and their workplaces and things like laundry and tax forms spill out over into the home. And as we move a bagel tier outward to the laundromat, it's all part of that same bagel. The front door to their home is a door in the laundromat that reads employees only. So that means you have to go through the business to get to the home, to the inner part of the bagel. Meaning you're an employee first, a family member second. The daughter, Joy, spaces out watching the clothes spin, focusing on the black void formed in a circle, much like the bagel's nihilistic void that she's drawn into later. But like Wayman breaking Evelyn out of her dread by turning her to the left with a loving embrace, Becky does that for Joy here, turning her to the left and kissing her. As Evelyn will later realize, Becky is to Joy what Wayman is to her. Like, notice it's not Joy who's really eager to talk to her mom about introducing Becky to Gong Gong as her girlfriend, it's Becky who has to push Joy into it. Customers, eat fast. Now, Joy covers Becky's tattoo since Evelyn doesn't really like tattoos. I'm just telling you now in case my mom says something dumb like you're fat or whatever. This is a super important line that sets up the key exchange between Evelyn and Joy later. You are getting fat. Now, on the surface, it seems like a pretty cruel thing for a mother to say. But remember, Joy had even told Becky earlier that this is Evelyn's way of showing that she cares. This is something that Daniel Kwan elaborated on in the Director's Cut podcast. Especially Asian American immigrant parents where uh, you, there's no time to talk about what you really want to talk about. And so you say things like, you're getting fat as a, as a way to say I love you or as a way to say I care about you, I notice you, I see you. Um, the first time I met his mom the, we had dinner and then as she got in a taxi cab that was what she shouted to me yes. to Dan yeah, and exactly. I was like Dan are you okay and he's like what <laughs> <laughs> when Evelyn goes back upstairs Waymond is packing the cookies that he'll later give Deidre he had waited for Evelyn to go downstairs because he knows that she'll snap at him to make Gong Gong's breakfast instead but he knows that these cookies are way more important to their IRS meeting after Evelyn snaps at the guy for putting shoes in the washer notice how Joy suddenly switches that washer back on employee first family member second Evelyn deftly slides a stool around with her foot little foreshadowing of how linking with the hot dog finger universe makes her good with her feet the bearded customer says, You know, my wife used to wear that exact same perfume, God rest your soul. Foreshadowing how she's gonna turn his grenade into a bottle of perfume to defeat this alpha form with kindness. Upstairs, the security camera glitches to show the multiverse circles in a new life path as Alpha Wayman takes over and parkours across the laundromat. Kihue Kwan, who began as a child actor in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and the Goonies, had to step away from acting, and he worked as a stunt coordinator in movies like the 2000 X-Men film, and Michelle Yeoh told Vanity Fair about his process for this movie. Now, three use, right? Three Raymonds. The Raymond Wong, uh, Evelyn's husband, is like a squirrel. Then the Alpha Raymond is an eagle. Dun, as dun, you can dun, see. Dun, dun, mm -hmm. As you can see. Right. And then the CEO, uh, Raymond, is a fox. Hmm. As he said, he had to run around the house or run around what, wherever he was practicing like a squirrel. So here we see Waymond go from squirrel to eagle, leaping and flying across the room. He grabs something from the register there, which may be one of the Bluetooths that he later gives Evelyn, maybe the umbrella that he later used to block out the elevator camera. Downstairs in the laundromat is a flyer for Evelyn's voice lessons, since she's also a singer, and a claw game called Grab Everything with a Raccoon Cowboy. Another raccoon nod who claws at hair to puppet a person to grab tools. And for Evelyn in this movie, a metaphor for how she's able to grab hold of everything. Joy tries to introduce Becky to Gong Gong, uh, 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 Evelyn physically steps in front of Becky, blocking her out of the frame, and weaponizes Joy's struggles with Chinese against her. Now, a little detail here, Evelyn always speaks Cantonese to her father, but speaks Mandarin with her husband. So it's not even Joy's fault entirely that she has this language barrier with Gong Gong, because around the house she only ever hears Mandarin. The only link to Cantonese would be her mother. So that makes Evelyn both a physical and a linguistic barrier. And after finally getting that moment with Joy, but using it to call her fat, Michelle Yeoh follows it with these beautiful, subtle, turns 
turns back at her daughter, showing that she's not heartless. She knows that she hurt Joy in that moment. She just doesn't know how to make her happy. And the Daniels include this close-up of Joy crying in the car, but notice that it's framed that we do not see Becky in the passenger seat. That's because this was a pickup shot that they added later when test audiences didn't get it first that this was a mother-daughter story. So they added this insert and only needed Stephanie Sue for it. And Stephanie gives such a shattered performance that it stays with us throughout the first act without any new dialogue needed even. But now in the home, you can see Waymond has put up more pairs of googly eyes on the laundry bags overhead. And this was not there before, but on the thermostat on the left of the frame, because he knows that Evelyn will turn off the AC when they leave and he wants to cheer her up on the way out the door. He knows he won't ever look at her for that. So he has to put these surrogate eyes everywhere. He asks, Yes, this movie breaks up the title, but not even in even thirds throughout the movie. Like the second part of the title comes as we break into the third act at about an hour and a half into the movie. And then the third part of the title comes at the very end of the movie. So in this way, the three part title of the movie is its own solution. Everything is Evelyn's crisis. Everywhere is where Jobu Tupaki pulls her apart to in the darkest part of the movie. But then all at once is Evelyn's ability to balance all of that in the final scene. So from here, we shift to the next bagel tier, the IRS office. On the drive in, they pass a pizza sign spinner foreshadowing another alternate light path Evelyn will jump into later to know how to weaponize the riot shield. In the elevator, Wayman shifts to Alpha Wayman and gives Evelyn these two Bluetooths. As a Matrix homage, this is really the story beat that Morpheus activates Neo with a cell phone to escape federal custody. Actually, we see this again later when Evelyn crouch crawls from cubicle to cubicle. Evelyn sees her current life path framed by the opening elevator doors, which is a pretty clever way to give this a 4 by 3 aspect ratio, which the Daniels chose for all flashbacks to give those a more home movie aesthetic. We hear recurring things as the floors ascend throughout her life, including a quick flash of teenage goth joy in an argument with Evelyn holding a black key ring band, the black everything bagel making its first sneaky cameo. Jamie Lee Curtis plays IRS auditor Deidre Bobidra, amazing character name, banana nana fofidra, and her banana yellow outfit was inspired by a real photo of a Cincinnati IRS agent in 2005. Now she has this brace on her wrist and it's apparently Jamie Lee Curtis choice to put the wristwatch over the brace, but we assume this brace is from like Carpal Tunnel from like auditing everyone, but it actually might be from her crashing her husband's car into her neighbor's kitchen, which she brings up at the end of the movie. And she alludes to here if you listen closely. I'm talking to my ex-husband. And of course, they foreshadow the butt plug shaped trophies. You don't get one of these unless you've seen a lot of bullshit. Deidre circles Evelyn's karaoke machine receipt, and she makes a thick black bagel with Evelyn's karaoke memory at the core of it. Deidre scoffs at all of Evelyn's hobbies. You're also a novelist and a chef and a singing coach and a Watsu technician. I'm sorry, what, what is Watsu? Like for back pain? Ah, these are actually alternate life paths that we see Evelyn have. Opera singer, chef at Rakakuni's restaurant, even a back pain expert. She defeats one alpha with a spinal adjustment. And then we see her reflection in another circular mirror, circles coming back, another looking glass for this Alice in Wonderland to tumble through. And when she zips into the side universe in the janitor's closet, the mirror glass breaks. Alpha Wayman says, Every rejection, every disappointment has led you here to this moment. He states the cure to Evelyn's curse. The answer isn't to stop daydreaming of your other life paths. Your mind is always going to take you there. It's to appreciate the moment you're in. Alpha Deidre punches into the closet. Jamie Lee Curtis doing a Michael Myers impression after herself hiding in closets as Laurie Strode. Now, as a debate over this paperwork, Evelyn and Waymond are clearly confused what they're even talking about. Come back next week. Oh man, Evelyn brushes off her confusion with her husband with a come back next week. Something that she would tell a laundromat customer. Again, employee first, family member second. Alpha Wayman verse jumps and the aspect ratio shifts. Now for the normal reality, the Daniels use the spherical 185 to one aspect ratio. Here it shifts to a 239 to one anamorphic lens, which from here forward is always used whenever a more stylized cinematic reality sets in. He unclips his fanny pack to use as a weapon, which is an important bit of symbolism for Kihui Kwan, who had to step back from on-camera roles after being typecast in stereotypical Asian male parts, emasculated comedic bits. But now he uses these trappings like Bluetooth, like fanny packs as badass weapons. And it's just to Joy slowing down to watch Key move. He wraps the strap around the arm. He kicks the gun out of the hand. He wraps the strap around the neck. He punches. He flips the guy across the room. This is all just great Jackie Chan style choreography because it's just funny and slapstick. Like he flips the fanny pack at the three guards. The first one ducks. He hits the second and then that one's head recoils into the third. It's just classic Jackie Chan, classic Three Stooges. It's a delight. But when Jobu Tupaki kills Side Universe Evelyn, we get dragged into the fourth bagel tier, the multiverse. But Jobu, as a master of this multiverse, is simply able to toggle through them like the the dial of a TV set. They might be close. 
I love how her hand stays in the same position with a different practical purpose for each reality. Like the first one shows her tagging the black bagel symbol on the side of a van, but then driving a bus into a crash and then back into a bar with a beer in her hand. Back in the outverse, Wei is strapped in while staying mobile inside the same family van that we saw the Wongs driving in before. Instead of passing a pizza sign spinner, it's now a charred corpse with a sign reading, Hail Bagel. Alpha Wayman teases the bagel. Something is off. Your clothes never wear as well the next day. Your hair never falls in quite the same way. Yeah, he's quoting Nine Days Absolutely, Story of a Girl song. We actually hear a bit of it later during the verse jump. She's gone home to finish the taxes. It also is a song playing in the sex dungeon. Clean up in there, all right? Yeah. Oh. Alpha Deidre finds them. <laughs> Now the music we hear during this Deidre fight is Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune, which this movie reprises again and again when Deidre's fighting Evelyn and Evelyn realizes that she loves her. This is the piano music that the alternate version of Deidre plays at home. Alpha Wayman asks for an agile skill to verse jump to, and the screen list, breakdancer, garbage man, dentist, mime, paralegal, VFX artist, haha, embalmer, gymnast, and math teacher. And when he gives himself a fourth paper cut, ugh, his face narrows as the lens shifts mid shot. This is the same effect used in Severance when the outside self shifts to their any as they go down the elevator. But Evelyn prematurely verse jumps and ends up in a divergent universe back in the car with Wayman. Daniel said they actually shot Michelle Yeoh on green screen for this entire scene. And Deidre's hand that grabs her from outside of the car, that's not actually Jamie Lee Curtis. In the side view mirror, you can actually see co-director Daniel Scheinert wearing Deidre's sweater. They used his hand for this take. This is Deirdre's hand back here about to grab her and pull her into another universe. Is but it, it looks a little bit like this hand. What the heck? What will happen? <laughs> 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 look, look, there's the brace, there's the brace. Deidre leaps down the stairwell to knee Evelyn. Another Matrix homage, of course, the slow motion shot of Morpheus flying down at Neo during the fight dojo demo. But Evelyn now zips backward, outside down a sidewalk, through a train station, a library, Japanese garden, church, museum. This is all actually background footage gathered by the Daniels and the director of photography by walking a camera around outside when they were location scouting. Evelyn ends up in a divergent universe where she did not go with Wayman from Hong Kong. She learned Kung Fu in a setting that looks like the Kill Bill Volume 2 Pai Mei sequence and becomes a movie star. They actually mix in real red carpet footage of Michelle Yeoh from the premiere of Crazy Rich Asians, which is actually the movie that inspired actor Kei Hui Kwan to return to acting. But ironically, this life path is what hurts Wayman the most. <laughs> His reaction is so sad here because for him, Michelle Yeoh, the actress's career, has been the red carpet life he wasn't able to experience for most of his adult life until now. But actually, the movie premiere Evelyn is really attending, based on the movie poster we see later in the lobby, is everything everywhere all at once. This whole movie is within this whole movie. Wayman says, We're about to keep moving. Now you've definitely got Jobu's attention. Come on. Jobu's attention and a thing we cut to and everything bagel on the office table. So now we shift to our fifth bagel tier, the complete bagel, encompassing it all. Because here, Wayman begins to tease Jobu Tupaki's origin. What does she want? No one knows. All we know is she's looking for you. And on the other side of this, when we cut back to Evelyn, she has eaten nearly her whole bagel just during this speech. Evelyn verse jumps into the hot dog finger universe, passing a hot dog poster where Daniel Kwan makes a cameo. He also plays the mugger and the third guy to get sucked into the bagel. We see how in this laundromat, the musical actors on the TV have hot dog fingers too, which fits with them earlier singing randomly, delicious. And we cut to an homage to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, but here the hot dog fingered apes cut off the evolutionary line of the normal handed ones. <laughs> <laughs> this messed up music is a nod to one of my favorite early era viral videos from 2009 on YouTube. Jobu finally reveals the bagel, exactly one hour into this movie to the second. Jobu Tupaki's everything bagel is this film's symbol for nihilism. For as some bagel eaters would say, an everything bagel leaves the palate with no discernible impression of any one of the distinct flavors. Everything can, if you choose, equal nothing. When Jobu first reveals it, there is nothing in the core, but the longer Evelyn looks at it, something new happens. A beam of binding light emits from the void. Therefore, Evelyn is capable of seeing something Jobu cannot, meaning at the core of everything. 
thing. Though, that meaning does not yet have a visible form. In the manager's office, another sighting of the black bagel form on the side table. Alpha Gong Gong's new wheelchair is powered by a coffee maker. A nod to Back to the Future when Doc's new DeLorean is powered by a Mr. Fusion. This makes him look like he's always steaming, like that noodle breakfast he's always complaining for. As he upgrades throughout the movie, he just stacks on more and more kitchen and office appliances. I love how anytime normal Waymond returns, he's always commenting on how heavy the furniture is. This is heavy! Ah! What's happening in my head? I'm your... I'm telling you, Key's squirrel persona is the funniest thing in this movie. Evelyn tries to explain. It's like that movie, Rakakuni. Do you mean Ratatouille? So the Daniels dedicated this movie to Alexander Wong, who is also listed as a producer in the fake out credits. He was the late father of this movie's actual producer, Jonathan Wong, and the namesake of the Wong family. And apparently Alexander Wong would mix up American movie names just like this. Just another example of how this entire movie is a love letter to the filmmaker's immigrant parents. And a subtle detail here that I adore, Becky calls Joy's phone and Wayman answers it. Oh, it's Becky. Hi, Becky. Hola. Yeah, Wayman said hola, Spanish for hello, because Joy mentioned earlier that Becky is actually half Mexican. She's half Mexican. And remember, we saw Wayman and Becky chatting lovingly upstairs in the next scene. Everywhere in the background of this movie, Wayman is doing sweet things like this to make people feel good. Evelyn verse jumps into a cleaning lady to find the sex room, and this kinky boss is a cameo by Daniel Scheinert, and his character name from his name placard is Richard Long, which is a nod to his 2019 film, The Death of Dick Long, and one of the sex toys in his room is a raccoon tail. Raccoonie! Evelyn then verse jumps to her childhood, in which she did not listen to her father to stop running, so she trips, blinds herself, and becomes an opera singer. And in one shot, we shift from a 4 by 3 home movie aspect ratio to 185 and then to 239, as she is once again successfully harnessing a powerful skill, this time lung capacity. She ends up verse jumping to the Raccoonie universe to fight Jenny Slate's character, where her rival chef is Chad, who already here in this first shot, you can see Raccoonie's tail poking out from under his hat. The two alphas Evelyn fights now are credited as Trophy and Bigger Trophy, brothers Brian and Andy Lee from the Marshall Club, who choreographed a lot of this film's fight sequences with stunt previs that allowed the Daniels to shoot these quickly and safely. Evelyn takes a hit and knocks into the person next to her at the film premiere. This is actually Waymond Lee, another producer in this film who might have been the inspiration for the name Wayman. To break free of Alpha Gong Gong's office chair, she verse jumps back into her kung fu universe to strengthen her pinky fingers, a nod to Kill Bill Volume 2 when Pai Mei taught the bride how to punch from only a few inches of space, which helped her punch her way out of the coffin later. She actually uses her pinky to uppercut one guy and it makes a Super Smash Brothers sound effect. <laughs> Alpha Wayman dies, and Jobu sarcastically applauds, finally speaking proper Chinese. Wow, oh. Evelyn passes out, leading to these fake out credits, directed by the Daniels, produced by Evelyn Kwan, not Wong, since in the Kung Fu Movie Star universe, she never married Wayman, and of course, Alexander Wong, the real producer's father. Chef Evelyn walks in on Rakakuni. Oh my god, that is actually the voice of Randy Newman, longtime Pixar composer, and Sun Lux actually wrote a You Got a Friend in Me style song. They got so many great lines out of Randy Newman. He's actually puppeting Chad to kill her. I see too much. You know what that means? Tell her. No, 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 please. I love how Chad is just like, just get out, just get out. So Evelyn manages to circle back to her home right before the party. It's worth noting that this is the Divergent universe, the life path where they went home after the IRS and the divorce argument. Our original Evelyn never left the IRS building, but of course that was just one Evelyn. Her consciousness splinters so that it's equally our Evelyn back at the laundromat party. And later when she hugs Jobu, the rocks and the fruit and the planets collide, showing how all the Evelyns are converging back into one. As Jobu confronts her, she toggles the tree branch into all these flickering weapons, which include a snowy owl, an 8-bit fire and a leg of meat, and a flag with a black bagel, and, I love it, an Oscar statuette, as if this movie is predicting its own future. Evelyn switches them into a kid's drawing, likely pulling from the drawing that Joy drew that she spotted in their home earlier. And I just gotta give credit to Stephanie for this line. Evelyn, you're doing something? We, we, we're just practicing karaoke for tonight. La, la, la. Jobu takes Evelyn to the bagel temple, where all the acolytes have the black circle on their foreheads and face shields to protect their eyes from gazing upon the bagel. Jobu gives her a book titled Everything Everywhere All at Once, based on Dr. Seuss's Oh, The Places You'll Go, but with herself at the center of the bagel. Inside the art is actually based on the graphic novel Persepolis, about a girl living under the oppression of the Iranian Revolution. And now we rapid fire flicker through, I'm not kidding, 69 exactly different Evelyns. They do recycle through all of them several times, but I counted there are 69 different 
different ones, which cannot be a coincidence. So to be thorough here, let's just quickly list them all. Hot Dog Fingers, back in the IRS audit, Young in Hong Kong, Pizza Sign Spinner, Kung Fu Movie Star, a translucent star child, back in the IRS Big Battle, back at home before the party, surrounded by floating lanterns, at a sword fighting ring, eyes closed in a glowing floor mirror room, in front of a car fire, automated robot arms assembling a Terminator Evelyn with red eyes, then icy on a frozen sidewalk, then in this poultry plant surrounded by chicken carcasses, then among a flamey pyre, smoky exploding fireworks, then in front of some bison in the American West, a little later her Alphaverse urn screams, and you can actually see the fishing line on it. We're so nihilistic we don't even care about hiding it. Then, as a cat in her red turtleneck, in the desert with some hazmat suit, a creepy one with her eyes bleeding black blood, wearing a gas mask, one is a horned reptilian monster with differently colored eyes, a bald male inmate with brew crew tattooed beneath the eye, a nun, then Evelyn in blue with soft glowing lights behind her looking very Star Trekky, an animated Evelyn, Evelyn is a white marble statue, a younger Evelyn arms draped over a glowing bar, as a baby with a sweater hoodie, a dating profile image in front of a beach boardwalk, as a male boxer with a black tank top in front of a green marshy area, then her eyes covered by a pointed black hat, then a more punk nun with a nose ring, facial tattoos, and colorful hair, a woman in purple living in the desert, a green wart-faced monster with a backwards ball cap, a skeleton in a nun habit, a girl in a kimono, wearing a white eye mask, in front of some cliffs with a rainbow, wearing old man glasses, a cute Instagram photo with the sweater over the face, in front of someone riding elephants, in a desert war zone, glammed up in drag attire, in a full old school chemical suit, as a priest with a white collar, face superimposed on a drone strike camera footage, as a tree, someone with an afro, someone blonde and smoking. This next one is in the red room from Twin Peaks, with meanwhile captioned, as grapes, a dog, in front of a Japanese garden pond, eyes closed in blue in front of a crime scene, and then my favorite of these, a Zoom chat with the actual small team of VFX artists who worked on this movie. That included Zach Stoltz, Ethan Feldbau, Benjamin Brewer, Jeff Desim, Matthew Walconan, Evan Halleck, and Kristen Lepore. The Daniel said that this team composed the movie's 550 VFX shots over Zoom calls just like this, which is so impressive. Then on Brighton Beach, with its charred pier in the background, someone with blonde hair lighting a candle, then a green alien with the pyramids behind her, then as a wax outline drawn on a literal Easter egg, then as the thumbnail of an Illuminati conspiracy theory video on YouTube, 1214, both the name of the uploader and the length of the video, on an I love tennis meme, then as a waxy painting in a tropical setting, then face peeking out from behind her fingers, then a face floating in front of a white house, then a really creepy one of Evelyn with a woman posing in, uh, I don't know, is that a dog Halloween costume? And then one with a lookalike for Michelle Yeoh with much more pronounced cheekbones. Oh, <gasps> 69 of them. God, that feels good. So as Evelyn lets Jobu's nihilism consume her, her eyes fill with black, a contrast from the red lantern with googly eyes that Wayman set up behind her to the right in the next shot. Now there's this subtle impossible shot here. Joy slash Jobu goes from being to the left of Evelyn when she signs the divorce papers, to when Deidre enters with the cops, suddenly appearing outside strutting to the left. Later, when Evelyn smashes the window, the daughter can be seen both sipping her beer by the laundry machines and reading a magazine by the windows. Nihilistic Evelyn grabs the bat, walks to the window, letting the karaoke machine crash to the ground behind her. The same her connection to her family is broken. And I love how Michelle Yeoh cocks her head to the side, Jobu Tupaki's gesture. And so Evelyn and Joy both become rocks. Now this isn't just random absurdism. We learn Joy chooses this state to make her mother feel as infinitesimally small and unevolved as she feels. Concluding, I've been trapped like this for so long, experienced and everything, I was hoping you would see something I didn't, that you would convince me that there was another way. So she took her mom on this journey to talk her off the ledge, and her mom can't do it yet. Meanwhile, Foxy Wayman delivers the most romantic line of the film. The sentiment I appreciate the most now as a married guy, there really is no bagel more delicious than just doing the laundry and taxes with your spouse or partner. And this dawns on Evelyn too. And I love how the Daniels light Michelle Yeoh with this orbiting ring light, shifting the angle of light in a circular path around her face. Joy hoped Evelyn would see something different in the core of the bagel. And I mentioned that blinding light that only Evelyn could see before. Evelyn now finds herself in the center of that light. She is in the innermost ring, the light of the bagel core forming a halo around her. As Evelyn finally hugs her husband, the movie finally shows us one thing that it had strictly kept hidden from us, we actually catch Waymond in the act of putting googly eyes on something. Jobu's hair now spells out Jobu on her forehead, and she summons a black bagel right there in the IRS office. Evelyn returns to her hot dog finger life with Deidre, who plays Debussy's Claire de Lune on the piano, and I can confirm that these are the actual notes for the beginning of Claire de Lune. Also, I love how normal Deidre has a wrist brace on her left hand, hot dog Deidre has a foot brace on her left foot. So like Neo in the Matrix, Evelyn finally sees this Matrix in the language of love and empathy. Like 
Neo, she stops the bullets and she transforms them into Wayman's googly eyes. She pops one on her forehead, forming a third eye of enlightenment and clairvoyance. And wielding Wayman's wisdom, Evelyn weaponizes love, the perfume of the bearded guy's wife, the spinal adjustment, the spanking of a lifetime, tugging Chad's hair the way Rakakuni did. And after appeasing most of these alphas, I love how Evelyn's Kung Fu master eats one of Teacher's cookies, because remember earlier, she used a cookie as an example of how anything can be Kung Fu. Evelyn figures out how to talk to her father, and we learn that the biggest reason she couldn't accept her daughter's love with Becky is that she had trouble accepting her own love from Wayman. It's okay that she's a mess, because just like me, and I love that as Evelyn looks past her father to Wayman, Joy looks back at Becky. And Becky simply smiles back, not even knowing Evelyn's Chinese words, but she understands the sentiment regardless. But despite finally accepting her daughter's queer relationship and introducing Becky as Joy's girlfriend, I really, really appreciate that this performative gesture is not enough for Joy. Because a parent's love and acceptance is one thing, but it isn't always enough to bring a nihilistic kid back from the brink. It's not about the parent fixing what's wrong with them. There's a whole other multiverse of chaos going on inside the kid. So we circle back to the parking lot. This immigrant mom just unloading every nag she's been wanting to get off her chest. You are getting fat. You don't call. You don't visit unless you need something. I hate your tattoo. But she acknowledges that of all the places she could be, she'll always want to be here with her joy. Then I will cherish these few specks of time. And it may be trite, but that is what joy is. Joy is a concept. It's a few cherished specks of time where things finally make sense. Just because it doesn't last forever doesn't mean it doesn't matter. In fact, because it doesn't last forever is what makes it so worth fighting for. In fact, the final scene of this movie doesn't fix all of Evelyn's problems. Like things are better with Waymond and Gong Gong accepts Becky, but the family business is still a mess and Evelyn is still distracted by alternate life paths. But those were never Evelyn's real problems. The cure she needed was the ability to cherish the few specks of time where things do make sense, where things for a moment feel like home. And this woman has found that path home. And a little sign of this newfound contentment, on her desk in the final scene, Evelyn's calculator reads 55378008, which is the old grade school joke of boobless when you turn it upside down. I love this throughout all of her stress counting her receipts. This just shows an ability to laugh at oneself. Now you could interpret this movie's message as, yeah, the world's a mess, but just put on blinders, look at the bright side, count your blessings, realize there's no place like home. And that may be enough for you, certainly enough for me. And may not be, and that's okay. But you know what? This movie never says that it has to be enough because we arrive finally at the center of the bagel. Does everything everywhere all at once and it's bid to say everything, really say nothing much about nihilism? Well, the film actually already told us what was in the center of its bagel. In the opening shot of the movie, the three of them frame in a bagel hole singing karaoke from the karaoke machine that Deidre even circled conveniently in black for us. Of the countless family memories and divergent life paths this movie hurls at us, this is one anecdote the film never actually shows us in an objective light. It's only ever reflected in this fantasy mirror. Therefore, everything everywhere all at once concludes that happiness is a choice. It's always there at the center of everything if we open our eyes to it and if we decide to cherish it. I firmly believe this film's multiverse joys are expressing the immigrant story of Daniel Kwan's family. And while I'm not gonna pretend I can relate to that personally, this movie definitely opened my eyes to it and it helped me see my relationship with my own mother. And remember how she used to cheer me up from getting bullied at school, not with any perfect words of wisdom, but just instead of turning left to go home, turning right out of the school parking lot and just driving me to a $5 matinee at the local cinema where the two of us would escape into another life path. And even if she didn't fully understand Pokemon the movie or whatever it was, she would never say she didn't like something. All she would say was, that was interesting. Which is probably why people now get on my case for never saying anything bad about movies. It's because I do not believe in bad movies, only interesting ones. Because somewhere out there in the multiverse, someone appreciated it. And I don't want to take that away from them. And to quote Rakakuni, divergent life path. We thrive on negative criticism, which is fun to write and to read. But the bitter truth we critics must face is that in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating it so. And so, with everything everywhere all at once, and with all films you see me discuss on this new channel I'm embarking upon, I will always choose the interesting life path, and I will fill my bagel with the fleeting vision of joy, the only thing that has ever made sense for a few specks of time, and something that I will, like this movie does, always choose to cherish. Thank you so much for letting me share this with you, and what title do you think we should deep dive into next? Let me know in the comments below, and subscribe to The Deep Dive, follow us at Deep Dive NR on all social media, you can follow me on my personal channels at EA Voss, and 
while I could take credit for this all myself, let's uh, take it away, tiny chef. <gasps> now we're cooking, cooking while nobody's, nobody's looking. looking. We're a family, diving deeply. deeply.